When the bridegroom cometh, will your robes be white? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Will your soul be ready for the mansion of the bride? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood? It is a, a question, it's a title to the song, but it's also a question. And it's something that you don't see through the eyes of faith. You're going to kind of you're going to think, man, that sure is barbaric, or that is gross, or what what is that talking about? But if you look through the eyes of faith and realize that to be washed in the blood means to have forgiveness of the sin, be purified, to be able to uh, live in fellowship with God, to be able to lay down the transgressions. Uh, break the chains of the yoke of sin and walk with fellowship in the glorious divine in, in fellowship with the Lord. What a great and precious idea that is. Uh, today I am overcome with this idea of a place of refuge. A place of refuge. Reading through the Bible and the Old Testament we are uh, have read through Joshua. This week we're in Judges and Ruth and uh, we're, we're making progress through the Old Testament. So we walked along beside the Israelites as they had journeyed in the wilderness. We crossed the Jordan with them as Joshua has led them into the Promised Land to conquer Jericho, to conquer Canaan. And now the distribution of the land to the 12 tribes is taking place. And in that process, Joshua goes back to this idea that Moses had uh, set up for the Israelites to have six cities. Six cities of refuge, three on the east side of the Jordan in the land of the half-tribe of Manasseh and, and Reuben and Gad, and six on the west side of the Jordan for all the other tribes' inheritance. So there's three on each side of the River Jordan. They're strategically located from north to south along the country, and God has already prepared and told them to build a roadway and maintain it. They would have easy access to the roads that they would lead them to these three cities on either side of the Jordan River. And the children of Israel were to have for them prepared a way to a place of refuge. And, and it would be maintained and kept so that they could get there quickly. It's a very powerful idea. And it transcends, remember what we've been saying the last several weeks. What was so physical for the Israelites is now spiritual for you and I. We inherit the spiritual blessings where Israel inherited the physical of the land. You and I inherit the spiritual blessings because of the work of our Lord Jesus Christ. So I am so thankful for this time together. I hope to bridge this gap between uh, Joshua chapter 20 and, and into the New Testament and what Jesus does for us on the cross and now he is making intercession for us. I hope to bridge that gap this morning. And I hope we leave today saying hallelujah. God had this plan in mind the whole time. It didn't catch God off guard. He strategically placed and located. He even gave them names that would transcend into things that would be meaningful for us through Jesus. I hope to get all that out this morning in our time together. And I hope you leave here with the same feeling I have, that God is intentional, and he has been blessing us from the beginning. He knew he would need to rescue us. He knew that we would need a city of refuge. So we are making our way to Joshua chapter 20, and we'll be in verses 1 through 6. If you'll stand with us while we read. Joshua chapter 20, the Bible says, The Lord spoke to Joshua, saying, Speak to the sons of Israel, saying, Designate the cities of refuge, of which I spoke to you through Moses, that the manslayer who kills any person unintentionally, without premeditation, may flee there, and there shall become your refuge from the avenger of blood. He shall flee to one of the cities, and shall stand at the entrance of the gate of the city and state his case in the hearing of the elders of that city. And they shall take him into the city to them and give him a place so that he may dwell among them. Now if the avenger of blood pursues him, then they shall not deliver the manslayer into his hand. 
because he struck his neighbor without premeditation and did not hate him beforehand. He shall dwell in the city until he stands before the congregation for judgment, until the death of the one who is high priest in those days. Then the manslayer shall return to his own city and to his own house, to the city from which he fled. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord God, for the reading of your word. And I pray, Lord, you give us insights. I pray, God, that you help this word to become bread. Let our souls feast upon it today. Let us hide in our hearts that we might not sin against you. We'll be quick to give you the praise and the glory. Thank you so much, God, for this time. Bless it now according to your will. In Jesus' name, amen. Let me give you the definition of the word or the term refugee. Refugee. One who flees to a foreign country or power to escape danger or persecution. One who flees in order to escape danger or persecution. So the idea that God gave Moses was to set up these six cities so that if a man unintentionally takes the life of another man, he might have a safe place to which to escape. Now this does a couple of things. First thing, it shows us the sanctity of life. This life that we have been given is precious. We are all created in the image of God. In his image, he created us, male and female. We now live and uh, by what this code of a, a, a divine engineering. We have been equipped and crafted and put together in our mother's womb. We are so crafted and, and about this body and about this personality, this body, soul, spirit is in the image of God the creator. And it is precious. Each and every life is precious. And we dare not take a life that is created in the image of God. And that's why it is incumbent upon the church, it's incumbent upon believers, uh, whether you consider yourself a, a conservative or not, it's incumbent upon us to proclaim the sanctity of life. That all life is sacred. All life comes at the, at the giving of God's hand, and we are to celebrate that. And, and I know today's, in today's warped ethical and moral environment, we are challenged with all manner uh, of attacks on this idea when life begins, what happens when there's defects with this life, and all manner uh, of those questions. But we as a church and we as Bible believers know that God has created us in his image. It's up to God to do what he will with the life that he's imparted and given. It's not up to us to lay a hand on it or to take it. It's simply God's divine will, and we must abide by it. Now, I'm coming from the frame of mind of a born-again believer in Jesus Christ and the Word of God. I'm seeing those things by faith, and that is peculiar to the world outside. It's very peculiar to the world that I would make such a bold statement that all life is conceived by God's command. Very bold statement, but we believe it by faith. Now then, so we are created in the image of God. This is a, a sanctified creation. It's a life that we've been given. In the Old Testament, God made a way for those who unintentionally took a life to have safe refuge. The example given in the Old Testament is what if you are with an axe chopping wood with your neighbor and the axe head flies off, unintentionally hitting your neighbor and it kills you. Then you are to flee to the city of refuge. You are to stand at the gate, you are to proclaim your case, and they are to take you in and give you safety from the avenger of blood. Because it was up to each individual family. It was, it was kind of, I, I guess we can reason with it like vigilante justice. If you kill a member of my family, I'm coming to kill you. It was a life for a life. And that created this idea of the sanctity of life. Not that it was barbaric or vengeful, but that each life had value. And it's not up to us to determine the level of the value, rich or poor or, or intelligent or, or those who struggle or, or any of those. It's not up to us to determine that or, or declare that. It's simply up to us to abide by God's authorship, God created. God is the creator, sustainer of life. We have created his image. We honor that. And even capital punishment is meant to be a reflection of how life is honored. I know that is, boy, if that statement got out on Fox News, we would probably, Fox Church uh, Baptist would become a hub of social media firestorm, but I believe it to be true. I believe it to be, I believe it to be true. Now then, 
Brother Keith, how in the world are we going to get from a city of refuge to Jesus Christ? I'm so glad you asked. Let us begin in our short time that we have together over these next few minutes. Let's get this idea and run with it. Moses compels the Israelites to a place of decision when they inherit the promised land. Will they be obedient? Will the children of Israel be obedient? So God has divided this land of Israel into sections for each of the 12 tribes. Right? Go with me. He did not divide a section for the Levites, did he? The Levites were to be God's priests. They were to perform the, the priestly functions, and they, they were not, they were to live off the sacrifices, those things that were brought to the temple to be sacrificed, those things that were brought into the altars to be sacrificed. So they had 48 cities that they were given to the Levites, the tribe of Levi. And they were to live in these 48 cities around the promised land, and then in these six cities, they were intentionally set aside for the manslayer, for those that used the manslaughter. These six cities. On the west side of the Jordan, there's Kadesh, Kadesh, Shechem, and Hebron. On the west side of the Jordan. On the east side, in this land of Reuben and Gad and Manasseh, there's Golan, Ramah, and Bezer. So these six cities are set aside. Even before God gave Moses the law, we find in Genesis chapter 9, Surely I will require your lifeblood. From every beast I will require it. And from every man, from every man's brother, I will require the life of a man. Whoever sheds man's blood, by man his blood shall be shed. For in the image of God he made man. Genesis 9, 5 and 6. We went over how that expressly claims and states the sanctity of life. Now then, if I get down to this point, we, we are all, stay with me. I know this is deep, and I know we've got to cling on to it with both hands. So, if we get down to this part, we are all guilty of manslaughter. Brother Keith, whoa, I didn't take anybody's life. Don't be so quick. We are all guilty because our sins caused the death of the innocent one. Capital O, innocent one the Lord Jesus Christ. Read with me in the first three verses of our text. In Joshua chapter 20, verse 1. Then the Lord spoke to Joseph, Joseph, Joshua, saying, Speak to the sons of Israel, saying, Designate seas of refuge, of which I spoke to you through Moses, that the manslayer who kills any person unintentionally, without premeditation, may flee there, and shall become your refuge from the avenger of blood. Can I tell you this morning that we are all guilty? Okay? We're all guilty. We're all sinners. We've all come short of the glory of God. What does Romans 6, 23 say? What is the payment for our sin? The wages of sin is what? Death. The wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life. So now God has appointed Jesus Christ. He is the only way. What does Acts 4, 12 tell us? There is no other name given among men whereby we must be saved. But Jesus Christ. That's the name. That's the name that's above every name. So we are to uh, declare that Jesus is our life. Jesus is the forgiveness of sin. But the sinner must come by faith. We must come by faith to the Lord Jesus Christ. What does Matthew tell us? In Matthew 11, Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. If the manslayer did not flee to the city of refuge... Would he have refuge? Would the manslayer find any safety? If he unintentionally killed his brother, would he find any safety if he did not flee to the city of refuge? No. There's only one place. There's only one place in all of Galilee that a, that a man who caused the death of a man, of another man, could, could flee to. And that's Kadesh. That's in Galilee. There's only one place in the middle part of the kingdom, Shechem. And then closer to the south, Hebron. We're talking about on the west side. If you don't flee to the place that God has prepared, you won't find safety. Hang on to that thought. If you don't flee to the place that God has prepared, you won't find the safety. If you don't come to the foot of the cross 
and repent of your sin, your sin will not be dealt with. We must come to Jesus. We must come to our place of refuge. So, the Israelites had these cities set up. They had roads built. They had quick access. Uh, they could come to the city gate. They could declare what had taken place. And the elders of the city were to make the decision to take them in, have a trial. If they're found innocent, they may remain in the city until the high priest dies. What in the world? You would forfeit your freedom, but you would gain your life. Forfeit your freedom, gain your life. Stay in the city of refuge until the high priest dies. And then you might return to your city or to your home. What a powerful idea. Let's, let's keep tracking along with this for a few more minutes. Let me skip down to this second point. We know that the first point is we're all guilty. Okay? We understand that. I hope you understand that you're guilty of sin. I hope you know and you can feel in your spirit that you sin and come short of the glory of God. I transgress God's holy standard just, just by being me. I, I, I transgress God's holy standard because he's holy and I am not. And therefore, I am guilty. I must take ownership. I must be personally accountable and responsible. In a, in a world where no one is personally responsible, I must see that my sin has separated me from a holy God. I must take responsibility for my sin. And then there's a, a little work to do. I know it's not work to earn salvation. That's not what I'm saying. But the source of provision has been made. I must go to it. But the thankful thing is, I am thankful that provision has been made. Verse 4 says, He shall flee. There's a provision made for you. There's a provision made for me if we flee to the source where God is present and available. It doesn't have to be inside these four walls. It doesn't have to be a physical location. He shall flee to one of these cities. He shall stand at the entrance of the gate of the city and state his case in the hearing of the elders of that city. And they shall take him into the city and give him a place so that he may dwell among them. These six cities, Kadesh, I'm going to give you the city, and I'm going to give you the name, the meaning of the city. Stay with me. Press, press, press on here. This, this is important. Kadesh, righteousness. It means righteousness. Shechem, shoulder. Shoulder. Bear the load. Where do you put the load? You put it on your shoulder. You go to Shechem. Hebron, fellowship. Find fellowship at Hebron. Let's cross over the Jordan. We cross over the Jordan, we find Bezer, strong fortress. Strong fortress. Go north and you find Raymond. So let me give you a little bit of understanding. I, wrote, I read this from Warren Wiersbe. So these names can be used to describe what sinners experience when they flee to Jesus. This is what you can experience when you and I flee to Jesus. He gives us his righteousness. Amen? There's no, there's no good thing I can claim. I stand here today fully uh, aware that my Righteousness is filthy rags. It's putrid. It smells. It stinks in the sight of God. Anything good I can proclaim in my own strength and in my own right is foul to God. God in His holiness rejects anything that I might try to undertake to do. I can only have an imputed righteousness. The only thing good about me is that I can claim Jesus' name. That I can cling to the cross. That I know that he died for me. That his blood was without sin. That as it flowed down Calvary, God accepted it. And that acceptance of that payment become the atonement for me. And now I'm accepted in the blood in the blood because of the blood of Jesus. I can obtain his righteousness at Kadesh. He gave us his righteousness. I can never again be accused of the former sin. Oh my goodness. There's no double jeopardy. I can't get in and then get out. I can't be charged with the same crime again. I'm a sinner. I come short of the glory of God. Guilty. Guilty. 
I run to refuge in Jesus, and I can no longer be accused of that sin. I have been liberated. I have been purchased. I have been pardoned. And now I will never again be accused by Satan. Yes, I'm accused. But it's as good as done. That sentence has been canceled because of the blood of Jesus Christ. Romans 8.1 There is therefore now no condemnation. He give us his righteousness. Amen. He carries us on his shoulders. Now it's about to get sweet, so you stay with me. What was David's job before God called him to be king? He was a shepherd for his one. What do shepherds do with the lost sheep? They go seek that sheep that's lost, don't they? What might the shepherd do once he finds that lost sheep? He's going to pick him up and he's going to drag him across his shoulders. And he's going to bring him back to the flock. The name of this second city shepherd is Shoulder. I don't know if it gets much sweeter than that. That my Savior, the Good Shepherd, came and found me when I was far, far away. He left the 99. He came and found the one. And because of his righteousness, he picked me up and put me on his shoulder. Shepherd. And because of his righteousness, and because he picked me up and put me on his shoulder, because he brought me back into his city, I'm now at Hebron, a place of fellowship. I now can fellowship with God. That's what we're doing here this morning. That's what we're trying to do. We're trying to read this word and we're trying to make sense of it and connect the dots and know that our God has always had this plan. Our God has always had this day. Our God has always had us in mind. Our God has always been able and has done and made a provision for our sin. Our God has always rescued us from this domain of darkness. Our God will always translate us from this place into our home in glory. It's always already been. Righteousness, cage, shoulder, shepherd, fellowship, Hebron. And then we get to travel down to Pisa, that fortress, that strong place. Satan is going to fire some wickedly fiery darts at your heart during this life. And Paul, the Apostle Paul knew that, and the Apostle Paul gave us Ephesians chapter 6. And he said, if we would put on the whole armor of God, we would have one particular piece of this armor that was crafted and made just for such an occasion as quenching the fiery darts of Satan. We raise our shield of faith and quench the fiery darts of Satan. And so we go to our fortress. We go to our strong place. We go down to Beza. We stand at the city gates and we beg with the officials and the elders, let me in, let me in. I claim the blood of Jesus. I'm here as a born again believer. I want to find a fortress. I want to find a cleft in a rock. I want to find a place hewn out with a, with a rock not made with hands. I want to find a place of safety. I want to come in to my leisure. I want to come in to my fortress, to my strong place. And we come in through the blood of Jesus. And then we dwell in Ramoth. Ramoth Gilead. We dwell in the glorious heights. We have found his righteousness. We have been born on his shoulders. We have entered into his fellowship. We have our strong place. And we dwell in the glorious heights of Ramon Gilead. And now we have one city left. We have Golan. We have one city left. And its name means exile. And that is exactly what we're doing on this side of the world. We are exiles. We are all pilgrims traveling through a strange land. While we're pilgrims, while we're exiles, we can be at glorious heights. We can have a strong fortress. We can enter into a time of fellowship. We can be born upon his shoulders. And we can have his righteousness. All of those six cities are accomplished in Jesus' name.
And now you know why I'm so blown away when you see the bread. Jesus fulfilled each and every one of those seeds. Now, let me finish with this thought. Our refuge is secure. In verse 5 of our text, we find these words. Now, if the avenger of blood pursues. I don't know. I've tried to play this out in my mind, but this must have been. When a family member dies and the only source of justice, when a family member dies and the only source of justice is for me to take my plan and go after the person responsible, there's, there's no police force, there's no FBI, there's, there's no detectives, judges. I must take my family and go avenge the death of my loved one. Now, if the avenger of blood pursues him, then they shall not deliver the manslayer into his hand. <coughs> the leaders and the elders of the city, once we come in and find refuge in that city, they are not to deliver me outside those city walls to the people who are coming to avenge the death of their family member. They can't deliver me. They must keep me and protect me. Our refuge is secure. Now, let me bind these two things together. Jesus on the cross. Seven things Jesus said while he was upon the cross. One of the things that he said was, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. This is not an intentional murder, God. This is an unintentional murder. That means that Jesus was declaring that the Jewish people that had cried, crucify, were not actually murderers, but they were manslayers. It was an unintentional death. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Now, I, I am going to uh, say clearly here that Warren Wiersbe has given me this idea. Very Bible scholar, tried and true. Love to read after Warren Wiersbe. And if Jesus is on the cross, and if he did say, and I believe he did, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He's declaring that those who are responsible for his death are not murderers, but manslayers. And if they have an opportunity to go to a city of refuge, you and I, our sins, are the reason Jesus died on the cross. We are not intentional murderers, but we are manslayers. And so we must run to our refuge. We must take our case to the foot of the cross. We are manslayers, but Jesus knew that we would be. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. You shall set aside three cities for yourself in the midst of your land, which the Lord your God gives you to possess. You shall prepare roads for yourself and divide into three parts the territory of your land, which the Lord your God will give you as a possession, so that the manslayer may flee there. Deuteronomy chapter 19. Now, I backed up a little bit into the law that Moses was giving to the children of Israel to pull out this very thing. That the manslayer had an opportunity for quick access to the city of refuge. Get on the road and make haste. Get there to that city. Pound upon the door. Tell the city officials, state your case. I was chopping wood. My axe head flew off. It struck my neighbor in the neck. He lay dead. I am now at the city walls begging for entrance because the adventure of blood is pursuing me hotly. Please let me into the city. Open up the gate and let him into the city. They must protect him from the avenger of blood. Now, then, we fast forward a thousand years, we come into the church age, and we now must proclaim I'm a manslayer. I must rush to my place of refuge. It's at the foot of the cross. I must go to Jesus, and I must beg for his righteousness. I must beg that he puts me on his shoulder. I must beg that he takes me into his strong fortress and a secure place. I must beg that he becomes my intercessor, my high priest, at the right hand of the Father, ever living to make intercession for you and for me. And that he will not die, but he always lives to make intercession for you and for me. So I have a permanent city of refuge in the Lord Jesus Christ. Because Jesus is not going to die. He's going to be ever making intercession for you and for me. That's the beauty of Scripture. That's the beauty of the Savior. Now, I know that was a 
journey. I know we covered a lot of ground from the promised land on the east side of the Jordan to the promised land on the west side of the Jordan that we went uh, from Kadesh to Shechem to Hebron to Bezer to Golan to Ramon. I know that we went all we went all over that territory to find those six cities. But I'm going to tell you the beautiful meaning of those six cities is found in J-E-S-U-S. The beautiful attributes of those cities are found in my Lord and Savior. You can bring your case and leave it at the foot of the cross, but you must come to the refuge. Your sins must be dealt with. My sins must be dealt with. And if I've never brought them to the foot of the cross, if I've never explained to Jesus, Jesus, I, I am lost and undone. I need you. Without you, I'm going to hell. Without the provision of the blood of Jesus, my sin debt will not be alleviated. I must have the blood of Jesus cover me and wash me. Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Only stand aside.